here at Hong Kong U, you know, we like to not just listen to music, we like to talk about music. It's an academic disease because we can't, academics can't just listen, we have to talk. And I'm delighted that the Takish Quartet have agreed to indulge our, our passion for talking about music. And they want to, you know, uh, indulge my passion for finding out more about what they think about the music they've been playing. And I'm sure you would all uh, agree with me that, you know, you've really taken us on a riveting adventure from early, middle to late Beethoven. And you've chosen, actually, in your program some of the most challenging quartets, particularly Opus 95 and uh, 131. So 95, Beethoven himself said, not to be performed in public, right? He's very worried that the audience won't get it. And um, Opus 131, I remember, no, I don't remember, the, the reports, I think Berlioz said, you know, he went to this concert and people were walking out after the first few minutes. They just couldn't get it. And Wagner took forever to come to terms with this piece. So I'm just wondering, when you're faced with this kind of very challenging um, Beethoven quartets, uh, what is it that you want to get across to the audience, since the audience you know, seems to find this music so difficult? What is it that you want to express? And I thought I would uh, address my question to the largest member of the quartet. I mean, in terms of instrument size, of course. Uh, yeah. uh, I, Andras, hope, Andras. I, was, I was hoping you would refine this statement, yes. Um, we adore, I mean, I mean, as Daniel was saying, uh, early period, middle period, late period, but for us, it's, it's great fun to, to discover, even in the early, works, uh, marks and nucleus and ideas for the late period. So uh, we, we have the luxury of, of enjoying a quote-unquote early piece while understanding that this will be a later Razumovsky Quartet or this will be a later Grosse Fugue. So we, we love that part and then apart from that we just, we just uh, trying to dissect every, every single two notes and, uh, and wonder about the character and, uh, and its general place in the, in the big hole. I mean, you talk about trying to dissect all this music. I mean, surely this music is so challenging that you have to keep finding ways of interpreting it. So how do you actually figure out how to play this thing? Or is there no way of figuring it out and you just sort of... <laughs> try your best to come to some conclusion. Geraldine, you want to try to answer that question? No. <laughs> um, we, we just, um, we love it so much, and there's so, it's just Beethoven, any piece by Beethoven is uh, the richest of riches. Um, there's everything. There's energy, there's passion, there's sadness, there's uh, vitality, there's tiredness, there's uh, just everything. And so, so what's wonderful is to be able to play these pieces over and over again with the same three other people because we get used to each other. And, you know, in, like in the scherzo when we had to th throw things back and forth, um, that's a lot easier when you do it over and over again with the th same three people. It's, it's not easy, <laughs> but it's easier. <laughs> so, um, I don't know, it's just so challenging and wonderful, that's not a very good I, answer. I think we're always um, tweaking details, and so we, we had a lot of fun rehearsing in this wonderful hall that you have here. And uh, we often send someone running out the back, up, I mean, up the stairs, to listen to, to the overall effect. And so even, I think it was this evening, um, Korchi went out and listened to the beginning of the second movement and uh, found that after about 20 bars of quite a nice character, for some reason I sort of drove ahead too fast, suddenly created, as Korchi put it, too much drama. And Korchi and Jerry went with me, so it wasn't a disaster, but uh, he said it was a little overdone, so I was aware, playing it in concert tonight, not to do that, just to try and maintain that nice kind of fleeting character, but that's quite typical that we're always sort of tweaking details in, in the work. So every performance is different according to the acoustic and to the audience as well? Currently. I, I think so. I, 
not because we finished the concert. I can tell you when I was listening the stage rehearsal, I was a little bit shocked. <laughs> no, I mean, in a good way, because there's a really huge hall and uh, I think all of us was hoping when the audience is in, the acoustic change, because it was just a little bit too resonant and we really had to work during rehearsal to get in closer to the bridge and uh, producing a more compact sound. So you want to? Well, yeah, just it, it's nice because that, I mean, one of the things that affects the way one plays is partly the way the hall changes with an audience, and certainly it was easier to hear each other with the audience, with you guys here, um, and also the way an audience listens. And uh, this is intended as a great compliment, incredibly quiet audience, and that actually affects the way you time things, it affects the way, for example, in the, in the fourth movement there of the 131, where it, it sort of goes down to triple piano, and there's a, there's a real sense of the music losing its direction, not being sure where it's going to go next. That's a little difficult to, to do if someone's having a sort of bronchial, asthmatic episode. Um, so we, we, we were very grateful for the attentive listening. Because it was an amazing performance, but I was just wondering whether, uh, what the challenges are right, in playing this kind of music, because I mean, when I was listening to um, actually uh, Opus 95 again and also the, the late quartet, I was thinking, yeah, this music is constantly changing its character, but in very extreme ways, not from highly juxtaposed manner. Right? I mean, how, do, I mean, it must be so challenging to do. I'm just fi trying to figure out how you guys managed to interpret all this and, and whether you, you, you spend endless time trying to figure out how to do the transitions and everything. Uh, I, you know, I'm not an expert, but Many, many years we worked so hard, these pieces, I mean, Opus 131, 95, and op of course the early quartet. And for me, I don't want to make it general, but the, the easiest, because so many hours of work behind this, when you are on concert, coming to the stage, performing, just forget everything and just enjoy it. And I don't know, just playing. Um, when we were when we were young and innocent and, <laughs> and uh, ignorant, I can, I can add. Sorry, Anders, had... you've never been innocent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fake is part of the business, so... Yeah. So we, we saw a piano, we saw a fortissimo, and then we made a nice organic crescendo and vice versa. And then it took a while until we realized, no, no, I mean, the drama comes from not preparing something. It should, it should uh, surprise you, it should surprise us while we are playing and projecting it. So ever since we are working on the stopping on a dime turning and, and that makes it very, very dramatic and ever-changing. But, but you're absolutely right that when we come back to this music, we, haven't, we hadn't played Opus 95 for quite a long time until we started working on it again in the middle of August. And it was the transitional moments that we spent the most time with, how to get from the sort of dramatic beginning into the more lyrical second theme and then, and then all, all those changes. Yeah, they're the things that eat time. And I, I don't know how it is for the others, but they, in that piece as well, because the changes are so fast, they they sort of tie one up physically if you're not careful. I mean, you can sort of get more and more knotted up as you make the changes. So you have to sort of try and um, maintain some sort of physical relaxation while you're actually playing this quite angst-ridden music. Yeah, um, it's the transition from the end of the scherzo to that beautiful viola solo that's so slow and crying. Uh, the first times we played it, I wasn't, after going like that for a long time, then you have to go like that really slow. And I wasn't sure what was going to come out, frankly. <laughs> it's getting a little better, though. Now, I think, um, even though I was sitting in my seat, I was going, oh, this music is uh, not so easy to figure out, you know, especially if you don't look at where the movements are in, in, the, in the last quarter. Where, where, where are we? You, you can get so easily lost. And there may be people in the audience that maybe have heard this piece for the first time and think, oh, this is just kind of crazy stuff. Like the first audience. I mean, what, what would your advice be uh, if this music sounds a little bit nuts? 
Well, you know, I think in a way that that first response and, and feeling a little bit disoriented and, and not quite sure where you are um, is, is in a way something to embrace. Um, and and because, because it's in that sort of space, actually, in some ways, one can be quite the most responsive. And I, I think I just come back and experience that more. Um, in some ways, the more dangerous listen is, is if you feel like you know the piece so well that you know exactly what's going to happen next and therefore you don't really need to listen to it carefully. And that's the same for us as players, that it's this sort of contradiction that, of course, we, we do actually know what's going to come next. Otherwise, you wouldn't really want to come and hear us play. But at the same time, we need to convince each other and, and the audience that every time we play it, there's a surprise and a, and a sense of shock in it. So I think that, that sense of disorientation and shock is actually is, is not anything to be embarrassed about. I think that's actually a really important meaning of, of the experience. I think you certainly got that sense over. It was an amazing performance. And I think we've unfortunately run out of time. But I just want to thank you so much for a riveting experience. I want to invite you back again and again. So let's do all the late Beethoven quartets. We love to. Let's do all the Bartok quartets, the Haydn, the Mozart, the Schubert. Ladies and gentlemen, the Takash quartet. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel.